And that is not that much farther away from slavery. So do you, when they were a slave, they were given housing, yeah. food, clothing, medical care. They asked the people asked them to work. Yes, there were land or landowners that were violent and and mean to some of them, but there were others that were humanistic. Okay, first of all, lady, slaves were not asked to work. Slavery literally means forced labor where your rights are stripped away. And if by medical care, she means brutal beatings every time they didn't follow orders, then sure. But this was one of my first ever interviews on the field and I wasn't nearly as confident or sharp as I've grown to be. If you watch my recent videos, like Trump supporter freaks out and grabs me, you can see just how much I've grown. But I'm gonna play this interaction for you, then I'm gonna break it down with a few analogies. Then I've got some other good stuff at the end. The whites, quote unquote, whites from the South are not the only ones that had slaves, yeah. okay? Slaves are all over the world. Slaves still exist today. When we're talking about slavery in the context of America, I feel like we're talking about the, the remnants left over from it, the systemic implications of it. Saying that slavery existed in a bunch of other countries, it's kind of reductive and it kind of skirts the focus away from the problem, which is domestic American politics. How did slavery in America affect black Americans living today? Do you think there's a direct effect from slavery to how black Americans are able to live today? No, I don't. They have a chance to learn. They live in the best country in the world. If they open their eyes and listen, instead of just focusing on their little area that and people that they hang out with, they would learn a lot. But even, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna ask your age, but from what you said, it sounds like you were born before the civil rights movement. Oh yeah. Black people couldn't buy houses and they were discriminated against in your lifetime when you were maybe a I'm baby. I'm well aware of that. You were five, so you don't think there's any downstream effects from the 60s or 70s. You don't see how any of that could they affect. They felt oppressed at that time. Yeah. But that's what Martin was trying to correct. But you don't see and any downstream did correct it. effects I, today. Right now, I see so many people living off the government handout. I'm pretty sure welfare use per capita is higher in red states than blue there's, states. Yes, but there's so many people living off of the government handouts, and that is not that much farther away from slavery. So do you, When they were a slave, they were given housing, yeah. food, clothing, medical care. They asked, the people asked them to work. Yes, there were land or landowners that were violent and, and mean to some of them, but there were others that were humanistic. I just want you to imagine for a second a game of Monopoly with two groups of players. One group represents white Americans and the other group represents black Americans. Now imagine for the first 300 rounds of this game, only white Americans are allowed to play. They get to move around the board, they get to accumulate wealth and properties. Even worse, any of the work done by the black American group contributes towards the white Americans' wealth. It builds on their wealth and the black Americans don't get anything. Now imagine after about 300 rounds, black Americans are finally able to join the game and play, but there's a few problems here. First of all, the white American group already has this established wealth, all of this property, and secondly, there are still rules that tilt the game towards the white American group. So in real life, this would be stuff like redlining, Jim Crow laws, and other forms of systemic racism that will limit the ability for that black American group to build wealth. So you can imagine at this point, the white American group is far, far ahead. And they keep saying, oh, but you can play the game now. You can play the game. You should already be caught up to us. But that's not how it works. You've had a 300 round head start. And even as the game progresses and the rules begin to change, think about the Civil Rights Act, the advantage held by white players wealth-wise and property-wise begins to compound and compound. And the black players, despite technically having the same opportunity opportunities under the new rules are starting at a significant disadvantage that you can't overcome in just one or two generations. 60 years ago was not that long ago, especially compared to the 200, 250 year head start that white Americans had. So this lady's belief that black people should have been able to catch up over the past 60 years is naive, it's disingenuous, it's harmful, it's racist, I could list words on and on, but most of all, it is wrong. That monopoly analogy is very potent because it shows 
just how much of a disadvantage, a systemic disadvantage, black Americans have been at since the inception of America. So in the present day, just because there aren't any explicitly racist laws on the book does not mean systemic racism doesn't exist. Systemic racism is a cyclical problem that stems from our previous oppression of black people. The average black American kid goes to a school with significantly less funding or significantly worse infrastructure than the average white American kid. And this is a function of laws like redlining that aren't too far back in the past. 60 years ago, again, is not that long ago. So you can imagine this black child grows up in a community that is a little bit worse off than the average, the median white child. Or maybe one of their parents was unfairly targeted. I mean, white and black Americans smoke weed at roughly the same rate, but black Americans are arrested and charged at a four times higher rate. And that is a function of systemic racism, despite there not being any laws on the books saying that this has to happen. And I could go super deep into the war on drugs, but I think you can imagine how the cycle perpetuates and perpetuates. Black people aren't inherently more likely to have single parent households. It is a function of the war on drugs and laws that were on the books just in the recent past. If they would eliminate so many of the drugs, I believe that children are able to get a hold of nowadays, there would be far fewer mental issues. What kind of drugs? Pot, for one. You really, you disagree with smoke? You best your sweet Bippy. I grew up with kids that, when it was just coming in, and I saw them make complete idiots of themselves. Yeah? And I said, no thank you. You you go ahead and do it, that's your choice, not mine. I've never broken so, a law in my life except get a couple of, uh, well, no, I've never actually got a speeding ticket. I've got a, some warnings. We can go smoke some pot in my car if you want to break a law. Uh, not no. on your life. Okay, sir. So how can we solve this problem? So there are a few routes that we can go moving forward. So first of all, as I touched on earlier, educational equity is very, very important. Making sure these underprivileged communities have access to this funding so they can have updated technology, updated textbooks, the best teachers possible, and incentivizing people to take advanced courses and to go on to college. That is a great way to start easing this massive wealth gap that has been built. And all of these points apply equally to white Americans who live in underprivileged communities as well because a lot of the same problems arise and of course everybody deserves access to the best level of education but I'm just talking about on average white Americans will already have access to better education and also the context of the conversation I just had is why I'm focusing so much on this. For but another great solution would be more affordable housing initiatives. First of all, build more housing, but create incentives to build more low-income housing. Create vouchers for first-time homeowners. If you guys want to see me make more videos breaking down systemic racism or debunking racist MAGA talking points, just let me know. I can also bring on some diverse Gen Z voices as well. I have a few names in mind that I'm working on getting on the show. But either way, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure to leave a like, make sure to subscribe, and make sure to have a great day.